I'm like kind of like a jack of all trades type of person. So I like being able to know a little bit about everything. I don't know, but he was in the orthopedic field, he had told me. And I was like, how are you doing that simultaneously with being a neurosurgery PA? That just didn't make any sense to me at the time because I always knew that doctors had to go through this rigorous route of like picking. Like once you went through medical school and you picked like a specialty, like that was just it. You know, you had to um, focus on that throughout residency and then that's where you would stay. But the fact that he mentioned, you know, he was able to go back and forth between neurosurgery and I think it was orthopedic surgery, if I'm not mistaken. I was like, oh, tell me more. Helping others is a calling. It's not a job. Hey, guys, my name is Boris. I'm a physician assistant. I've got a very special guest for you today. I've got a first year PA student at Rutgers University who's got a really cool story. I think you guys are going to get a lot out of this interview. This is... Michelle DeLille. I'm a first year PA student at Rutgers, like he said, and I'm so excited to be here sharing my story with you guys. Yep. Before we started recording, Ms. Chanel was actually telling me she had watched one or a few of my videos before getting into PA school, and she said they were helpful. And then when one of her classmates, my buddy Elijah, actually brought up the topic of coming on to you know, my show, my podcast, whatever you call this thing, she said, <laughs> yeah, he really helped me get in. So now she's actually on the other side of that being in PA school, getting through it. Like, how does that feel? It's so full circle because mm -hmm. honestly, like I didn't, it was so hard going through that process of applying to PA school. And I didn't have necessarily someone to help me in the beginning of that process. So going on YouTube and like watching your videos, like really helped with applying to PA school and just knowing how to like, you know, show who I am and what, what my story is. And so like being on the other side is like so full circle. Like, it's just like, I get to help others now, so. That's so cool. Like that's gotta be a really cool feeling. Cause like I, I did the same thing. I watched a lot of PA influencers and YouTubers. And back then there was like five or 10. Now there's like 10,000, right? Like everyone's <laughs> doing it. The second people get their offer letter they start going in the Facebook forums. Hey, I can help, I can help, pay me. Yeah, and I'm like, man, I've been doing this since you were like in diapers. You need to stop right now. Uh, <laughs> but either way, it's cool. People want to help. I get it. Uh, but like, I just remember watching like Adana, the PA, uh, PA coach, who else? Be positive, James Kim, that guy. Like, I remember watching all this and I can only imagine like watching these guys and them helping me and then like actually getting in and like being able to talk to them. So like, that's just, it's just a really cool, like full circle situation. I know, seriously, I'm so excited. <laughs> Literally, it's just like, so yeah, I guess just like you guys watching out there, it's so possible. Less than a year ago, she was just like, oh man, I really hope I get in and here she is. And yes. you know, she's doing so good. Now I want to know how she did it. Right, right. I was, yep. yeah, I can't even imagine. A year ago this time, actually too, like April, I was struggling. Like I was like struggling to like write my paper, watching videos. Um, I have guinea pigs. So at that time, one of my guinea pigs were sick. <laughs> yeah, oh, no. it was a bad time. It was a bad time. I was struggling so bad. But now I'm here. It's so crazy. I was literally just there a year ago. That's so nuts. Did the guinea pig make it? No, he passed away, unfortunately. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. That's so good. That's okay. I Dang, know. I didn't mean to like, <laughs> I didn't mean to bring down the mood. <laughs> Oh, you're okay. Everybody <laughs> understands like caring about a pet. And then like it paints the picture of like, I was really hoping to do this thing. It was really hard. I'm trying to get the grades and the hours and now my pet's sick. It's like, you know, life doesn't stop just because you want to get into PA school. And sure enough, you know, you got to push through anyway. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Yeah. But anyway, more about you. So tell me a little bit about you, Ms. Chanel, where you grew up, how you grew up, like what was life like? before you started college? Yeah. So I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. I'm a diehard New Yorker. Like I'm going to always represent. Anyways, <laughs> I grew okay. up in Brooklyn, New York <laughs> and life was very interesting for me. Um, I feel like I had a different experience growing up in New York because 
um, culturally, I was surrounded by, by, I was surrounded by, you know, a lot of different cultures and a lot of different people. Um, and I, it didn't make me afraid to speak to people. So I would like go on the trains and just randomly speak to people and that's normal. <laughs> so I've always been like super outgoing, but anyways, um, my family is from the Caribbean. So my dad is Haitian. My mom is Grenadian. And so from before even college, I, was in a situation where I didn't even understand like those process, like the process of applying to like higher education and things like that. Um, it was very interesting because my parents always enforced like the fact that I needed to go to school and get an education just so that I could have a better life. But they didn't understand how to, or didn't have the resources to actually walk me through that process. So it, it was just interesting in the fact that I leaned on, my school system for support a lot. Like I would stay after school, talk to guidance counselors and reach out, watch YouTube videos. The same thing I did to get into BA school, like watch YouTube videos, um, do a lot of research and things like that. But honestly, I always knew I wanted to go into medicine. So from middle school, I applied to like, uh, for, so in New York, you have to apply to like high schools and stuff. Um, I applied to a uh, health professional high school, high school for health professions and human services in Manhattan. And then that's where I got my medical, uh, my medical assisting certificate. And I was able to, you know, work in hospitals at a really young age, like 17. So I think that like really set me up to be able to like make those connections with like PAs and doctors and MPs and things like that. But yeah. Mm. So one thing I definitely want to go back to well, two things. One, it's really cool that in, in New York, you kind of pick what high school you go to based on what you're interested in. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> I lived it. I know like in a lot of other places, they're like my friend actually was explaining this to me yesterday because I didn't know. But you have zones where you automatically have to go to that high school. Um, but in yeah. New York. Yeah. <laughs> so in New York, um, I. So I, like I said, I grew up in Brooklyn, but I didn't want to go to a high school in Brooklyn just because I wanted to be outside of my comfort zone and I wanted to take the train to school and, you know, wanted to go far and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, I just applied to a lot of schools in Manhattan and, you know, you, you go through like the application process, kind of like college in a way, like they accept you and things like that. Mm. And yeah, I went to school in Manhattan. That's so cool. And then like you kind of you know what you're interested in. So you go to the school that focuses on that. And then you even get like a trade job out of it, like the medical assistant thing without like graduating high school, going back into more training. It's like, no, like you get to work as a medical assistant in high school. Right. Which is awesome. Yeah. So you get your exposure, your experience, your connections that way. So that's cool. Also, I could just already tell you're like self-starter, motivated, like nothing brings you down. Like if you want to <laughs> do something, you do it, which in this profession, it kind of takes. Yeah. You know? My dad, I was telling my friend yesterday too, like my dad, he was not happy with me wanting to go so far for high school. Cause I had to take the train by myself. And at the time of starting high sure. school, you're like 14, right. Or 13. Mm -hmm. And he was not happy about that. But I was like, this is the school that's going to get me to where I need to go. So I need to go to this school, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So yeah, you got to do what I mean, you he's do. concerned about his girl. Can't blame him. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I know it's annoying that parents care about us, but they care about us. So like, it's, that's the thing. Um, also, I just wanted to, like, you said it like it was no big deal, but most people who get into PA school, especially, they didn't have to do what you did. You know, somebody is usually helping them pretty much from a young age. Like, oh, okay, kiddo, you want to do this? All right, you need to start applying now. You need to take these classes. This is how you study for those classes. Are you studying yet? What are you doing playing video games? Go study. Like people grow up like that because their parents and like their families know how to do this stuff. And it's like for generations already, you know, you didn't have that. I sort of had that. I was like guilted into like doing well in school, but they didn't really teach me how, right? Typical immigrant parents. They're like, you need to do well in school. Okay. What do I do? I don't know. Figure it out. Right. You know, th that's, that's what we all experience. So <laughs> for some of us, it, it's, it takes longer. Like for me, uh, for you, it sounds like it kind of pushed you into doing the right thing earlier, which, you know, good on you. Uh, but I just wanted to call attention to that because, like, people who grew up in, like, environments where their parents went to college in the U.S., like, it's just different, guys. Like, we had to figure this out on our own, which a lot yeah. of people are in that boat, but a lot of people just aren't. So 
I wanted to really just call attention to that. Uh, oh, two, what's that? Oh, no, I said thanks, you know. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. <laughs> I think also the lag on StreamYard and my ancient MacBook is like also causing issues. <laughs> Bear with us, guys, <laughs> I promise. Uh, but anyway. So you said you wanted to like do medicine from a from a pretty young age. What made you want to go into medicine? You just knew or how'd you know? So it's funny because, you know, most children hate the hospital, right? Like you hate getting yeah. needles and shots and things like that, Scary. right? Not for me. Um, I think no. no. <laughs> so basically as a child, I was in the hospital a lot because um, I have like chronic asthma. So I was always like in the oh. pediatric unit, like talking to all the nurses, getting that exposure to healthcare. And I think the way that I was being treated as a child in the hospital really made me want to be in that environment when I got older to, you know, have that same impact on others. So, yeah, I, I, after I, like being in the hospital a lot as a child, I was like, oh, you know what? Yeah, I want to be a doctor. So that's basically how that happened. But Obviously, I'm in PA school now, mm -hmm. so I had that career change, that career <laughs> shift while I was in college. I think every kid has that. If they were even a little interested in medicine, they're like, yeah, I'm going to be a brain surgeon. And then, you know, reality strikes and you go, maybe there's other things I can do. Yeah. Besides like the most <laughs> crazy thing. So that basically covers it. Like the summary, you had asthma, you went to the hospital a few times as a kid. And then you were like, I want to be a doctor and take care of people just like I was taken care of. Basically, yeah. <laughs> okay. Why why a doctor? Well, you know, <laughs> that's a great question too. <laughs> um you know, I don't know. That's actually a really good question. I haven't thought about it like that before. Mm. Mm. As a child, it just seemed like mm. hmm, that's you know, you did your big one with that. That was a great question. Let me think. Okay. <laughs> As a child. Not to put you on the spot. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. Um, I just think that as a child, like, watching all, like, the medical students and, like, the doctor come into the room and lead and say, okay, I think this is what's wrong with the patient and, like, them having to decipher what was wrong with me and, like, do all of that, I really liked that portion of it. Like, it was very intriguing to see, like, the way that they thought um, to come up with, like, a diagnosis and a treatment plan. Um, and so I think that's what intrigued me the most as a child. But then <laughs> as I got older, that changed, <laughs> kind of, that changed, yeah. Yeah. So what intrigued you was that the doctor was kind of in charge, they were leading, you know, they were the ones making the decisions. Right, right. Right. And then they knew all the stuff that made you feel better. Exactly. Okay. And you wanted to do that. Yeah, I wanted to do that as a child. It's funny because you mentioned the neurosurgery thing. And I that's like literally what I said when someone asked me in fourth grade. They were like, what do you want to be? I'm like, okay, a brain surgeon. Like, <laughs> For real? I, I swear to you, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I didn't even know that. I just kind of pulled that example out of thin air. Yeah, that's exactly what I said. I remember to this day, that's what I said. So where'd you get brain surgeon? Why'd you want to be a brain surgeon when you were a kid? It's, I don't want to keep bringing up sad moments, but... Oh, no. <laughs> okay. Sorry, you don't have to talk about it. <laughs> no, it's it's not too sad. It's just... My sister, she has um hydrocephalus. And so she like would come home with oh. like these cool surgery marks and she would explain to me how like the doctors did brain surgery on her and I was like oh that sounds so cool like I want to do that so that's really where it came <laughs> from yeah oh man so you've had medicine like in your childhood like just interwoven like your personal experiences and then your sisters yeah <laughs> yeah it all like just worked together I guess I'd say so that definitely makes sense but okay what was I going to ask? Is that what you wrote about in your personal statement or how'd you write that? No. So <laughs> I, well, I did mention that I was always on the pre-med track. Um, I mm -hmm. knew that I wanted to be in healthcare, but what really solidified my decision to go the PA route was um, an experience I had in a hospital as a teenager. 
So mm -hmm. um, I had went, and at that point in time, I had never heard of PAs because, um, like I, I, like I, I heard of PAs, but I didn't necessarily know what they did or who they were. You know, I didn't know about their roles or responsibilities in the healthcare team. So mm -hmm. when I went to the hospital that time, um, when I was like sick in high school, I went to the emergency department. And it was an emergency PA who treated me and saw me. And it was like the interpersonal relationship that they really had with me in that moment because I was in a hospital for a reason. I had no idea what was going on. I was by myself. Um, my mom was like on the way, but because I went to school in Manhattan, she was coming all the way from like Brooklyn. And mm -hmm. at that point in time, the PA just really like developed that relationship with me to help me understand what was going on, what they were going to do, like actually walk me through what they were going to do for me. And I did not have that experience with a doctor. I think mm. as a child, I was fascinated, like you said, about just the way that they led the team. But developing those personal relationships with your patients was something that I saw in PAs from that point on forward. So that really solidified my decision to go the PA route. And then on top of that, experiences after that. Like then I started working with PAs and that's a whole other part of this conversation, I guess. But working with PAs after that too really helped to solidify my decision about the PA route. So did you also like work with and shadow doctors? Yes, yes. And there was just a stark contrast and you just really wanted to go the PA route. Yes, because funny enough, <laughs> I worked at a neurosurgery practice. Of and as a medical assistant, yeah. <laughs> and um, so I got to work with three different PAs, but I also got to work with um, two doctors at the same practice. So I was having experiences with them every single day individually. And there was such a stark difference in mm -hmm. their roles, responsibilities, interpersonal relationships with the patient, um, and just how they went about everyday life that I was like, I really, really love the PA profession. And I think that's what best fits my personality. So that's why I went along with that. And I had the opportunity to work with nurses there as well. Um, also like working in the hospital as well. I got to interact with those professions as well, but the PA profession stood out the most to me and I felt aligned with me the most. <laughs> yeah. So in your essay, you probably focused on like how much experience you've had. You've seen literally every health profession and like this is definitely the one for you. Yes, yes. I definitely focused on that a lot in my essay. Because it makes mm -hmm. a difference, you know? It really does. I mean, how can you say no to that? The person isn't just like, oh, I want to practice medicine and this is shorter, the end, I want to get in. Like, okay, that understandable, same with everybody else. However, like do the time, figure out exactly why, you know, do the shadowing, work with other professions, see what you want to do. And then if it's still a yes, then yeah, absolutely apply. Right, exactly, exactly. So what is it besides just like the interpersonal connections, what else is it about PA? So one of the PAs that I was working with, I'll mention him. <laughs> His name was Kevin. Um, he was working in the neurosurgery practice as well. He mm -hmm. mentioned that he also did orthopedic, um, was it surgery? I don't know, mm -hmm. but he was in the orthopedic field, he had told me. And I was like, how are you doing that simultaneously with being a neurosurgery PA? That just didn't make any sense to me at the time because I always knew that doctors had to go through this rigorous route of like picking, like once you went through medical school and you picked like a specialty, like that was just it. You know, you had to um, focus on that throughout residency and then that's where you would stay. But the fact that he mentioned, you know, he was able to go back and forth between neurosurgery and I think it was orthopedic surgery, if I'm not mistaken. I was like, oh, tell me more because I'm very much like a I like to consider myself and for what I hear from other people, I'm like kind of like a jack of all trades type of person. So I like being able to know a little bit about everything and still have the skills to do everything, you know? So once he said that, I mm -hmm. was like, okay, um, I really like that. I, I would be able to like move, pro not profession, sorry. I really like that. I'll be able to change specialties or do multiple specialties, like two at a time if like that's my desire at the time or if that's something that aligns with the needs of my community 
that really intrigued me. So, yeah. I think they call that ADHD. <laughs> you know what? Right? Like, where you just like want to do everything at the same time. <laughs> yeah, low key. Yeah, I I, I low key do think I have some ADHD tendencies. Mm -hmm. I think we all do. Yeah. Like literally everybody in your class, everybody in my class, myself included, we all have it, you know, and we put it to good use by being in medicine. Cause I noticed that like, especially at work, my work is designed in a way that I have to be doing five different things at the same time, but none of them get done at the same time. So it's like, I have to see a patient then I have to chart on the patient two patients ago. And then I have to do labs for a patient two weeks ago. And then I have to call somebody that's calling back from last night. And it's like, I'm doing this all at the same time. And then someone's always going to pull me away about another patient. And like, it does drive you crazy, but somebody without ADHD could not handle it. There's no way. I agree. <laughs> you know, cause like we've been living like this with this chaos in our head since we were like, you know, one. And then like people who don't have that kind of chaos in their head, they can't handle medicine. Right. So it's like a superpower. <laughs> Absolutely. I, know. I agree for sure. I agree for sure. Yep. Which makes PA even more perfect because like, let's say you get very good at orthopedic surgery. You're very good with joint injections. You're good at helping out with like, you know, uh, disc replacements. If it happens to be a spine surgeon too, uh, what do you call it? Shoulder, knee, whatever, hip replacements. And then that's all you do. Well, wouldn't it be cool to also do like all the stuff that neurosurgical PAs get to do and round on those patients? It's just like more to do, but it's more interesting. Right. <laughs> you know? I yeah, agree. I definitely appreciate that aspect. So now that's we true. definitely understand why PA. How did you, once you finally decided, okay, this is what I want to do, you probably looked and you were like, crap, it's really hard to get in. So now what? I'm not even going to lie. I was actually very taken aback by like the process of applying and like knowing your chances of getting in. That really surprised me. Like, especially the fact that a lot of PA schools, they prefer that you get experience before you go to PA school. And I was like, dang, like, I don't really have a lot of experience. Like when I was in college, I didn't really have a lot of clinical experience. So I, so I was just like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? It was like it was a huge like shock factor. But that's when I guess like I just started getting on my laptop, watching videos like from that. It was a wrap. I was like, OK, I know I want to go to PA school um, at this point. Is my degree going to fulfill the uh curriculum requirements like that was the first and foremost thing which i ended up messing up there too because i didn't take microbiology in college <laughs> which is so odd um but i also didn't take anatomy and physiology because i had a, a general batch bachelor's degree in biology so they didn't offer um a and p and so it was a whole process it was a whole thing and then trying to get clinical experience and Volunteer, the volunteer experience, I'm not going to lie, I was pretty good with because of like undergrad and high school and stuff like that. But yeah, everything else, it was a big shock. It was, it was a lot to go through everything. And then on top of that, like not, I guess, have someone to tell me exactly what to do. Like that was the hardest part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what I was thinking when you were saying definitely about the ANP thing, because somebody who like knows what it takes ahead of time, they would have said, no, you need to take this too. look at the prereqs uh, and then getting your experience. Like I had a bunch of pre-meds in my college who did CNA. There was like a local nursing home and they got all certified and they got like hours and hours and hours like during school basically. And their classes even worked around it so they can get more hours. And wow. then like looking back on that thinking like, man, that is perfect. Why didn't I do that? Cause no one told me. I was thinking right. like, you guys want to wipe old people's butts. That sounds awful. Why would you ever want to do that? And then sure enough, you know, five years later, that's what I'm doing. But as a much older person going like, man, I wish I would have done this earlier. Right. <laughs> Literally, it's that mentorship is so important. People so, telling you, like, this is what you need to do. This is how you get into these programs. Instead, you like you either figure it out way later or you just don't go. Yeah, you know? exactly. Exactly. So I well, had like of, everything. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, like, in terms of applying to medical school, I did have, I wouldn't say I have the GPA, no. But in terms of curriculum, I did fulfill all the requirements. It's just mm -hmm. 
once I made that decision to change to PA, it was a whole thing to figure out. Definitely. Like, like you said, the mentorship is so important because my advisors were pre-med, but they didn't Mm. tell me, okay, this is what you do for PA school. So, yeah, they didn't even tell you to take A&P. Yeah. I figured that out as I was, because I wanted to apply in 2021 and I figured it Mm -hmm. out then that I needed A&P and I was like, oh, wow. So. Oh, that sucks. It worked out. out. It worked out. I mean, you're where you need to be. I get it. But also if you would have asked a good mentor at that time, they would have said, still apply, just make, you know, start, sign up for A&P right now, make it contingent or whatever, but you could still apply with them like in progress. Right. Exactly. Which, man, mentorship is so important. So are you mentoring people like right now? What are you doing with that? Yes. I, because I didn't have the mentorship that I needed, like Mm -hmm. prior to getting into PA school or even just prior to the application process, um, I made it a point, like, I'm one of those people you were talking about, like, once they get accepted, they go on Facebook and they're like, yeah, hit me up. Like, that was literally me because (laughs) (laughs) I just wanted people to, you know, have that, like, personal connection with someone, basically somewhere Mm -hmm. that they want to be, like, be able to speak to someone in the spot that they want to be in. And I wanted to be that reaching hand, like, that helping hand to show them, okay, like, you do Mm -hmm. have support, like, you can get here. Like, let me help you so that you don't feel like you're all alone or like overwhelmed by the stress of applying to PA school because it's stressful enough as it is. Oh yeah. So, yeah. Um, I'm I am mentoring um two people right now. Mm-hmm. Um, but then I at school like those are people I met. They reached out to me via Instagram, but um at school we also have like at Rutgers right now we have a pre PA club. So I talk to like the pre-PA members and try to just make sure they're on, you know, what they got to be on to get, (laughs) to get to where I'm at now, you know? So. Oh yeah. I'm sure they really appreciate that. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I actually have a meeting with them today at seven 30. So that'll be good. I'll tell them about your videos. (laughs) I was going to say, let me donate them some books, you know, especially if they're working on their personal statements. Oh my God. That's so kind. Oh my God. I'm sure they would love that. Absolutely. I'm just typing that in our little uh, Instagram chat thread. So don't forget. Oh, no problem. (laughs) Free PA club. Yeah. We'll definitely talk about that afterwards, but yeah, just give me an address and I'll send them. I mean, how many people are in this club? It's like 30 people. (laughs) Um, It's, it's a, it's a lot, but um. I mean, we don't, I'm sure they wouldn't mind sharing. Honestly, anything is helpful. Like anything Mm -hmm. is helpful, you know? Yeah, I'll send them like 10 or something. I feel like that's enough for them to share, especially the seniors working on their essays. Right. Uh, No, it's so good that you're doing that. I try, I try. It's a hard world out here, you know? Like, so wherever you can help, just try to be, especially with PA school, it's so hard to get into. So. Mm -hmm. Well, and like the the later you start, the harder it is because there's, it's like a finite number of things you need. You either need a super high GPA or like a master's or some way to prove that you can, you know, get through the program. That's one. You don't have that. Nothing's going to help you, you know? So that's number one. And of course, the sooner you get on that in undergrad, the better. So like if you can catch these kids at freshman year or sophomore year and just tell them, look, you need to focus on grades get out of your fraternity, maybe stop doing sports, get your grades up. Like that's number one, two, and three. So like catching these kids and mentoring them earlier is best. Two, if you can get your experience or at least start doing that right after college, get that because you need that. It's like all this stuff that no one tells you. And then like you're an adult and you're older and you have bills and you might have like kids and then you're trying to figure it all out. Then it's overwhelming. Exactly. You know, so mentorship early, so important. So, so important. I'm glad you're doing that. Yeah, me too. I'm really happy to, like, I'm really happy to help. Seriously. Seriously. Um, Feel free to say absolutely no to this, because if you say no, I'll just cut it out of the video. Um, But did you want me to drop your Instagram in the info for the video or no? Oh, yeah, sure. Of course. Why not? (laughs) Because you might get inundated with, like, hundreds of messages. I'll 
reply to them. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. So I guess we'll leave it in the video then. I told the same thing to James, and he's like, no, 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 put it on. So we actually put it on the video, not just in the info, because now it's not even deletable. <laughs> um, so maybe I'll put yours in the info just in case. If you start getting inundated, I'll just take it out for a bit. That honestly, I'm happy to. It's nothing to answer a text message. You know what I'm saying? Like sometimes mm -hmm. I don't see my phone, but if I'm like on my phone, I will answer a text message. Like if it's a quick question. And a lot of a lot of the pre PAs, I'm sure, will have the exact same question. So like it's Probably. nothing to answer that. You know, at least for All me. Right. Yeah, I don't mind. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, we'll put her Instagram in the info for this video. Feel free to shoot her a message. If she doesn't get back to you like right away, just hang on. She will. Right. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. All right. So we'll do that. So we basically covered most of our topics except for how has the first year been and all of that. But before we get to actually being in PA school, I totally forgot to ask you about your stats. Do you mind sharing? Of course not. So <laughs> Woo, whenever someone asks me this question, I just it just brings me back to a place where I'm like, I really got here because there was a uh -huh. point in time, you know, before with my stats, which I'll share. Um, I so when I graduated college, my cumulative GPA was a 3.2. My science GPA was a 2.9. Um, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Ooh, that's the that's the reaction I had too. Yeah, how'd you um, overcome that? Oh man. Um, luckily, because I didn't take microbiology and AMP one and two, I took those mm -hmm. uh post box and was able to bring up my science GPA to exactly a 3.0. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> yeah. When I was an undergrad though. My GPA was on on the lower side because I, like you said, I was so involved with like extracurricular activities and like kind of burning myself out in a way, which mm. took a lot of time out of putting effort into my studies. So mm -hmm. when I realized that I had to like have, you know, like a standard GPA for getting into PA school, I didn't really have a lot of time to, I guess, like take a whole bunch of like post bot classes or take like a master's. I, I could have, but realistically, I didn't want to because I was working, you know, like you, you take these, I mean, you work at these, um, like healthcare jobs and you don't really get paid as much. And so, you know, at that time I had my own apartment and stuff. So I was like, oh, uh, like I kind of just want to get into PA school, you know, and work towards that. But yeah, I, I just felt like I didn't have the time. So I really put a lot of effort into microbiology a and P one and two and just hope for the best. Like if I'm being honest, I, um, yeah, like my GPA was on the lower side, but I feel like other parts of my application shined for me to where if a school was considering me holistically, they, they would see that. And that was honestly like my hope. <laughs> so after I took those classes, my cumulative GPA, um, went up to a 3.3 and then my science GPA was a 3.0 on the dot. Mm -hmm. So which yeah. that's enough to get your foot in the door at a lot of programs. Oh, for sure. For sure. You know, it's not like ultra competitive, but it's usually enough to at least get your foot in the door to where they can talk to you and see your personality and stuff. Right, right. Um I will say though when it I mean there are a couple of classes that I definitely definitely could have like taken over or like took more advanced classes. Um mm -hmm. But I, I just really wanted to get into PA school. I really <laughs> wanted to get into PA school. That's the honest truth. Like, and you communicated yeah. that, and it came through, and they gave you yeah. a chance. <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, you heard it here. Like, it is possible, even without doing the masters or the post back or who knows what else. You know, if you have like a not, you know, not a two point one, not a one point four. You know what I mean? like a get your foot in the door type GPA, it's still quite possible. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. You it's know? it's very possible. Yeah. And what was your, how many hours did you have when you applied? Clinically? Um, mm -hmm. Like PCE, like actual patient care hours, I had about 3000 hours. Oh, wow. Um, that's a lot. 
Yeah, because I was working, like once I graduated college, I was working full time. I started working full time at the neurosurgery practice. And then I I went part time there after I think maybe about a year. And then Mm -hmm. um, I started working full time as a phlebotomist. But there were days that like I went to the neurosurgery practice and worked from eight to 12. And then at one o'clock, I would go to the hospital and work in phlebotomy from one to nine. So I was grinding. Yeah, I was definitely yeah, grinding. 13 hours. Yeah. <laughs> Dang, yeah they must have seen that because because they must have seen like, OK, you're young. You just got out of college and you're applying with 3000 hours, which you don't usually see. Right. So they could tell you're hustling. And I'm sure something like in the personal statement or in your other experiences or something else showed them that, like, you just you work your butt off, you know, and you've, if you can just focus all that effort on PA school, then you should be able to get through just fine. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, yeah, I had about 3000 hours total. And then I also Mm -hmm. did like, um, what was it? I'm sorry. Why am I blanking? While I was at the neurosurgery practice, I also would do like workers comp stuff, like administrative things, Mm -hmm. like administrative duties. So that didn't play into my PCE, but I got, I did obtain a little bit of just healthcare experience from that too. Right. So you had, I guess I would call like a stacked resume. You were doing a lot of stuff, like quickly, all at the same time. (laughs) Yeah. You know? So there's not like one perfect formula of like who gets in, who gets through, you know, because yeah, technically a high GPA would be best. But if you look a little bit deeper into the applicant and you see, holy crap, like, okay, this is the grades they're pulling off, but they're also doing this, 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 and this. Like there's a lot going on here. Right. Right. So, yeah, and I'm, I'm glad they I'm, picked you. You said what? I said, I'm glad they picked you. Man, tell me about it. I'm glad they picked me, too. <laughs> 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 oh, man. Yeah. So, hey. <laughs> but it takes it's I feel like it. I feel like it takes us a, a, a special program to, like, le- look deeper than the GPA, because mm-hmm. You know, that's what they see. That's the very first thing they see. That's the very first thing they use to, like, screen you. You know, like, do you have the GPA? And, of course, GPA is important. You know, like, of course, you want to see that they're going to be able to, like, push through PA school because it's difficult. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy thing to do. But, you know, um, when you like you said, when you take into all the factors of, okay, like, this person has a 3.0, but they were working two jobs. They were doing Mm -hmm. this. They were doing that. It's like, okay, it puts a different perspective, like, you know, they managed to obtain a, you know, a 3.0 GPA while doing countless other things. So. Yes, absolutely. My best advice would be not to be doing countless other things and to focus on that GPA. However, (laughs) if you happen to like have to work to feed your kids or to do whatever, to pay rent, you know, you don't always have that choice. And so I'm glad that there are programs out there that can see that. Right. Right. That's awesome. That being said, they obviously picked somebody who can get through the program because you're almost done with year one. Is that yes, right? Yes, I'm almost done with year one. And you're doing okay, yeah? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm doing great, I would say. Honestly, my classmates ask me advice all the time about like how I balance PA school because it is a difficult program, of course, but I'm always doing something. <laughs> like I'm always like doing some type of self-care activity, whether it's like snowboarding or roller skating or... I don't know, fishing. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I'm always doing something. So when do you yeah, study? I think I'm doing pretty good. You said what? When do you have time to study? I so the way I like to study, I will like bust my behind during the weekdays. Uh-huh. Like I will stay after school, study till mm-hmm. like which is not I, I won't say it's the healthiest way, but I will study till <laughs> until like nine o'clock or 10 o'clock, because for me, I only need six hours of sleep to be effective, (laughs) I'm not going to lie. So if I study until 10, yeah, if I study until 10 o'clock and go home, I'm going to sleep by 12, and then wake up at 7 for class at 9, then I'm fine. I will do that throughout Mm -hmm. the week, and then on the weekends, I will take the weekends off, 100%, because it's so important for me to have that self-care. 
for me personally. Like, I really need that time to reset so that I'm able to go back into the next week and grind, you know? So, mm-hmm. yeah. So I study, you know, I I hear... study a lot <laughs> during the week. <laughs> yeah. I'm just hearing, like, so some PA students who are struggling reach out to me and they say things like, I study 12 hours a day, even on weekends, seven days a week, and I'm still behind, you know? Mm. So it's, I don't know if it's necessarily the sheer hours. Did you just like figure out what works for you and you're just good? Or do you just have like a, what do you call it? Like a photographic memory and you're just brilliant? Like, (laughs) how does it work? How do you make it happen? Oh, no, I definitely need to study. (laughs) Um, um, You know, that's a great question. I feel like at the beginning of my first semester, um, it took a little while to figure it out because I was learning things at a quicker pace. I'm like, oh my God, like what is mm-hmm. going on? Like this is so overwhelming. But it's a lot. I just yeah, it definitely was a lot. <laughs> but um <laughs> honestly, I just figured out what works for me. Like I know that ever since I was younger, Sundays is, is like a no for me. Like I'm not doing any work on a Sunday. And mm-hmm. even with working like that's something that I stick to consistently now I know that won't always be the case and that hasn't always been the case but for the most part I try to just create those boundaries like you need to have boundaries um Mm -hmm. and so like yeah like that's that's it like I know I'm not gonna do work on a Sunday and I just I just make sure to study throughout the week like I like I finished class yesterday I finished medical physiology and pathology um and then with whatever the material was that I learned in class, I will stay after school to go over that same material and make sure I get it down before oh. I move on. So that's a technique that I do. I will also like do practice questions, make sure I'm actually able to, you know, understand the material and apply the material. Like it's different things. I incorporate different methods, but for the most part, I don't, I would, I would definitely not say, I I don't, I definitely do not study 24 seven. I definitely take that time. But during the week, I'm just making sure that I'm like doing like active recall. Like if I study something, Mm -hmm. if I study something yesterday, I'm making sure that um, two days from then I'm going to study it again, just to make sure I hound those, you know, get those topics. Mm. It sounds like you're very proactive. Like you don't let yourself get behind. As soon as the material is presented, you're on it a second time. So you're putting in your second rep that same day. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, they told us the ideal way to study when we started school. They said pre-read just very quickly, then pay attention in class. Don't be working on other stuff. And then after class review, and then you shouldn't really have to study all that much because that's three reps already. But like nobody, okay, I don't know about nobody, but very few people have time or the discipline to do that. Right. But it sounds like you'd like have the discipline to be like, no, this is optimal. We're going to get this done. And then I can chill on Sundays. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I mean, like like you said, like, I don't always, <laughs> I don't always, I'm not going to sit here and lie and say like, I always um, study like the material the same day. Cause there's days I have exams and I need to study that. Like I prioritize that material, but for the most part, like, yeah, I try to prioritize, like I have a calendar and I, before the thing is you get a syllabus at the beginning of the semester or whatever. So mm-hmm. before like that, I guess topic even comes up at the beginning of the semester, I know when I'm going to study it. Um, I'm going to allot what time of the day to study it because I know that it's, it's a non-negotiable for me <laughs> to like mm-hmm. do that on the weekend. You just got to have non-negotiables. Like you gotta, you gotta prioritize. Mm-hmm. And I was, I wish I was as disciplined as you in school. Cause like you start out that way, or at least I start out that way. And then the chaos just overwhelms you. And then you're just in survival mode and it's just like, all right, what's next? What's next? All right. Oh, now I have to study for this and this and this, and then you're not sleeping. And then Sunday night you're grinding again, you know, like, and we get through it, but I feel like that's the experience of a lot of people, maybe not most or everyone, but a lot of people, but it sounds like you're like disciplined, you're on it. You got your system that works, you know, and you just like keep doing that. So good on you. I, I wish I did that in school. It takes time. It, like, yep. I have always been like this. It takes time. I think it's just yep. because, like, I'm, like, even right now, like, I'm in a leadership position, right? So I have mm-hmm. to be on top of it. Like, because I'm 
I'm making, not only am I like looking after myself, but I have to make sure in my leadership position that everyone else is doing their roles too. So it's like, mm -hmm. they have to have someone that's going to keep them up to par in the midst of all the chaos that's going on. And it has to be me, right. you know? So mm -hmm. I think that's really where it comes from. Like leadership roles, like an undergrad leadership roles. Like when I was younger, like I'm, 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 I try to organize as much as I can so that I'm not overwhelmed, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, and, and there's also the motivation of doing things for others. Yeah, yeah. Because you know? when people are counting on you, trust me, you're going to do it. <laughs> that's very true. That's very true. I, I feel like that's why I even started the channel when I was in, uh, like, halfway through first year. Or actually at the beginning of the first year, but mostly halfway through first year is when I took it seriously. Because as a student, all you're doing is kind of serving yourself, right? Like, you're studying to get a career for yourself. You're getting these grades for yourself. But like when you have other people counting on you, it's just like as people who want to provide care, we want to care about people. You know, we want to do that. So like school is kind of counter to that because you're just kind of serving yourself. So you have like a, a leadership position where your own classmates are counting on you. So that makes you like work harder and be better for them. Right. Exactly. It's like a little known hack. You know what I mean? Like it sounds more like more work and more difficulty and more responsibility, but it's so much more motivation. Right. Right, exactly. And then because you have to be like on top of everything, it's less likely mm -hmm. that you'll fall behind. Yeah. So like it's it's hard to explain to someone who just thinks kind of negatively, like, oh, there's only so much energy I have and I'm already giving all this much. It's like, no, you don't understand. It's like like those cars in Fast and the Furious where they press the NOS button. I think this was James's <laughs> metaphor, where they like they're going as fast as they can, but then they press the button and they have like that extra boost or whatever. It's the same right. way with like people counting on you and having like motivation. <laughs> It just makes you more efficient, smarter, and it just it works. I promise, you know. Right. So maybe exactly. start tutoring or like to, this is a message to those who might be struggling in PA school. Maybe start tutoring a class. Maybe I don't know. Figure out some way to like maybe add to your motivation where other people are counting on you doing well, not just you doing well. Right. Right. I don't know how you're gonna do it, but. <laughs> No, yeah. I mean, it's true, though. It's true. And then, like, like you said, like tutoring, like you have sometimes it's good to like divert your attention to something mm -hmm. else so that you have that break from school so that you don't feel that burn out like that burn from like being mm -hmm. in your textbooks all day, staring at your iPad all day. Like sometimes you just need yeah. a break, you know, and then you can bring yourself back to schoolwork. So I think like tutoring or like having like a position in school really helps with that. Yeah, especially if you get to be creative. Because a lot of us, like medicine is not just science. It's not engineering. Like it's creative. Right. It's working with people. It's finding like creative solutions to doing things. And like school takes all that away because there's nothing creative. You're just learning, learning, learning. <laughs> so like if you can find some creative outlet, maybe that's good too. Uh, well, creative outlet plus discipline. Because like it's like I have to get through these flashcards and these PowerPoints. And then I get to go whatever. Paint, <laughs> sing, play guitar, whatever. Uh so yeah, just like find ways to keep your mental health going during school. I agree for sure. Yeah. It'll this make also, all the difference. It's also, it's, huh? Oh, I said it'll make all the difference. I think so. I remember Mimi was on here a while ago, a few months ago, and she said how like exercise helps her. It seems again, counterintuitive. Like, why are you, instead of taking a chill lunch break to like eat and relax, why are you running to the other side of campus just to go run, get sweaty, shower, and come all the way back? But, like, it supercharges you. It makes you feel better. It gets your blood moving. It's just, like, yeah, sometimes more effort actually gives you more, like, potency. Right, exactly. Yeah. So quit being lazy out there. Go, go like, go run. Go take on some extra stuff. Help some people. Yeah. Don't feel good. That's what the, the, what the kids say nowadays. I'm saying kids like I'm not also young, but. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're a kid. <laughs> Kids nowadays, they say you got to get on your Zoom. So get on your Zoom. Like, do what you got to do. <laughs> we're not on Zoom. We're on StreamYard, which is better than Zoom. <laughs> is that the new kid thing? Get on your Zoom? Yeah, like, get on your, yeah, get on your Zoom. <laughs> That's like one of those scooter companies, though, that, like, you rent. I think they're Zoom scooters, right? Oh, honestly, I have no idea. Oh. Yeah, that's, I don't know. I'm not a kid. I'm no. I'm like nowhere near a kid anymore. So I'm not even gonna try. You you don't even you don't look old at all. I'm 34. I'm not gonna say get on your Zoom. <laughs> I'm not saying it. 
You're not, I'm not old, doing it. understandable. Understandable. <laughs> I mean, I'm not like a geezer, but I'm also not like a 21 year old saying things like get on your Zoom. Like, that means it's not sense. happening. <laughs> no, I'll say things like check your inbox. Uh, I sent you a StreamYard link. This is your appointment. You know, I'll see you then. Uh, you. <laughs> I'm not going to say get on your Zoom. It's also, it's so weird talking to like a half frozen screen because like I can see you, but it's like your reactions like 10 seconds after you said something. And it's like, it's driving me crazy. Oh I need a new goodness. MacBook. This thing is so <laughs> slow. Or I'll use an iPad or something or my phone. I think that's going to be the next interview. <laughs> I'll like, I'll try to figure out something else to do. Uh, is it bothering you? Am I frozen? No, you haven't been frozen at all, actually. It's just me then. Maybe it's my Wi-Fi. I don't know, man. It doesn't matter. Uh, sorry for that interjection, y'all. No, you're good. I, I mean, I can hear you clearly. You're coming in clear. That's all that matters. I can hear you great. It's just that your picture is frozen and my picture is frozen. So I think it's probably my internet. Yeah, because I can see you. I can see you very clearly. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's me. Dang. We'll figure it out. <laughs> um, the only thing left on our list of topics is how's PA school been so far? Any advice? We kind of got there, I would say. Is there anything else you would add about surviving first year of PA school? Ooh, wow. Um, I'm going to be so real. It is brutal. <laughs> oh, yeah. It is <laughs> That's brutal. a good word for it. Like, it's it's tough. It's, it's really tough. But honestly, you just got to you got to push through. I would say you got to get on your Zoom. Yeah, you got to get on your Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I would say, I mean, I feel like I kind of touched on it. Like, definitely, like have a schedule, mm -hmm. make time for mental health, like self care, and yeah, those are. I would say those are my two big things because if you can do mm -hmm. those things, like you can, you can get through just fine. Yeah. I think so. I mean, if you're smart enough to get in, like if you're smart enough to get the grades you needed in science courses, as long as you heed Ms. Chanel's advice and like stay organized and motivated, you should be able to make it through, you know? Right. I was um, actually, I do have advice. <laughs> good. Let's hear it. So on the first day of PA school, because you're going to get there. So it's not even a, if you get to PA school on the it's first day of PA school. You need to write a note to yourself <laughs> saying, no, I'm being so serious. I'm being so I, know, serious. I believe you. It's just funny because no one ever says this. <laughs> you need to write a note to yourself. You need to answer two things. Well, you need to do two things, right? The first question, well, the first note that you need to write to yourself is why are you in PA school, right? Mm -hmm. Because then, I'll, you know, I'll explain. You need to write down why you're in PA school. Why did you decide to come to PA school? And the second thing that you need to do is write your full name with PAC at the end. Because Ooh. when it's hard, because you're going to lose the motivation. That that That's a mm -hmm. given. Like, you're going to lose the motivation along the way. But if you can go back to that note and see your name with PAC at the end and see why you're even doing this in the first place, it's going to help to push you through. So first year PA school, make sure you do that. That's my that's the best advice I could give you because <laughs> it gets rough. But if you mm -hmm. can if you can do that and go back to that and you know ground yourself and why you're even here to begin with, you'll find the you'll find the motivation to get through. Trust me. I like that. I'd also add like just visualize like what does PAC actually mean to you? Like what does that life look like? Because exactly. it doesn't look like sitting there in your little apartment or dorm room, studying, studying, studying. That's PAS. That's PAS life. Exactly. PAC life is a little different. Exactly. You know, PAS life is you're out of the dorm room. Now you got a house. Or maybe you have two. Now you got like a car. Or maybe you have two. Exactly. Like now, now you're eating Chipotle and it's $21 to get it delivered. And you're like, well, that's stupid. But you're not mad about it. It's just like, oh, okay, whatever. They're just numbers. You know, that's PAC life. So it means a lot. So, yeah, definitely. I, I love the letter and also just visualize exactly what your life is going to look like. All you got to do is tolerate these couple years. Exactly. That's it. It won't last forever. It. it won't last forever. No, that's what not. you've got to keep telling yourself. <laughs> like 100%. Yeah. 
then you got a whole different mess of struggles to deal with, but they're good struggles to have. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like it's never going to get easy. You're not signing up for this to be easy, but it's going to be, it's going to be hard in a different way, you know? So we, we shouldn't even talk about that. We're, we're just going to say, yeah, just do your letter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. Just, just, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to demotivate anybody. <laughs> I don't think, no, I don't think you're going to demotivate anyone, but it's just real, real being realistic. Like, you know, mm -hmm. cause you think, yeah, one thing, you think like, honestly, as a pre-PA, like I thought like PA school was going to be the end of me. <laughs> mm -hmm. like I just <laughs> thought like no seriously like I just thought I wouldn't have time for anything I'm like oh my god I'm gonna be drowning like I just need yeah. to prepare like how to I guess get through these hard times like it's gonna be rough mm -hmm. and it's honestly like there are gonna be times it's like that like you're gonna wonder like why did I even choose this profession for real I'm not gonna yeah. lie because it's so hard at times but like in the back of your head you know why you're doing it you know like there's a reason yeah. that you're doing it and it's not gonna be and like it's, this forever. It's not. It's gonna be this hard for a season, and then that season's gonna end. And I think one thing that people struggle with, not even like the whole studying or like the you know tactical aspects of school or the profession, is they don't want to change who they are. You know, they don't want to become like a tight ass uh, nerd. They don't want to become someone who's like mean and doesn't have time for people or is short with people because they have to get back to studying. And you're not changing to be that person forever. Exactly. It's just when you're in school and maybe when you're new in your profession, that, then sure. But then I'm telling you as someone who's like crested that hill, because the hill is not just school. It's not just first year of school and then that's it. It's, it's all of school and it's probably your first couple of years in practice is just straight up fight or flight. Like I am going to lose it any moment <laughs> now. But like once you first off finish school, you realize that you're not going anywhere. You're licensed. You're okay. No one's taking it away from you. Um, <laughs> you're you're kind of used to your job, at least a little bit, to where you understand most situations. You're not freaking out 24-7. You're freaking out, like, very rarely now. That's when you start to breathe again. And right. that's when you start to soften. And you're not that pain in the butt who doesn't have time for anyone anymore. Because you're just, you're not in fight and flight anymore. You're just, like, chilling a little bit. You know? Exactly. And you can turn it on. You know, somebody comes in with an asthma attack that's a kid and their oxygen's 87. Like, yeah, you can turn it on and you like you get there again, but you're not living in that fight or flight. You can turn it on as a tool. Uh, but like it's good that you're developing that like instinct, that killer instinct. But like once you're used to it and you know everything's gonna be okay, you don't have to be that person anymore. Right. So I don't know if any of that made sense, but like you have to kind of try on that persona of constantly being stressed to know that you can do it when it matters. And then when it's time, you're going to shed it and you're going to be a better person. Exactly. But in exactly. school, you're going to be that person constantly. <laughs> right. <laughs> but that's it's fine. okay. That's fine. It's just, it's what you have to do. I noticed that because I don't know if you guys have mentors. Do you guys have like an upperclassman who's a mentor? Yes, we have bigs. So like yeah. um, the second years, mentor the first years. Okay, perfect. We, we had that too. Uh, I can't remember mine's name anymore. I haven't talked to him in years. But I just remember talking to him on the phone. He was so organized and businesslike. It's like he was nice and he was answering my questions. But you could tell it was like every second that I was talking, he was ready for me to be done talking mm -hmm. because he had something else to do. You know, and then I was like, man, do you like, I didn't tell him this, but I was just thinking in the back of my head, like, do I have to be like this? Like, is this what school's going to do to me? Because I don't want to treat people like this. And then you get there and then you see yourself doing it and you're like, oh, no, maybe, maybe I do. And yeah. then, you know, and at work, you have to kind of be that way when you're still brand new. But then, like, eventually you just chill the heck out. It just, it doesn't last forever. Right. Right. Yeah. But it, no, everything you said is 100% spot on. Obviously, you're, you're the expert. You're the PAC here. <laughs> but so you know what you're talking about to that extent, too. But yeah, everything is spot on because like a lot of people don't want to change that aspect of them. They don't want to seem like that mm -hmm. cool friend. And like yeah. as someone who was like previously in that position too, where like I was like cost constantly doing fun things, like always like doing something, it mm -hmm. was hard for me to transition into that when I first got into PA school. Cause I still wanted to like 
live my life in a way, but yeah. still do good in school. And sometimes it's sometimes you really do have to like crack down on your schoolwork. Like you can mm -hmm. j you can have fun afterwards, but you sometimes you really just gotta call it. Like you, you're not trying to be like you know like the quote unquote lame friend or whatever, but mm -hmm. you know the people who's not in PA school sometimes won't understand that. Like you have to study like it's not a choice like <laughs> you have to yeah. because at the end of the day like you're paying for this program and you know you got here you want it so bad to get here you wanted it so mm -hmm. bad so at this point you have to do the work it's not an option anymore and yeah. it you know pa school will like i mean i'm only like what my i'm about to be like my first year in but what i've learned so far is that pa school will really like mold you and change you you mm -hmm. have to you have to adapt and you have to be able to like tell people, hey, I can't talk today, but like let's let's catch up over the weekend. Or, you know, I can't come to this outing, but you know what? I'm about to be on break in like two weeks. So I'll come up with you then. Like mm -hmm. you just have to be honest with people and just tell them like I'm not trying to, you know, cast you out or make you feel like I don't have time for you, but at the same time, like I need to do the work to get through this program. So what you what you said is spot on, spot on. That's like well, the don't sell <laughs> don't sell yourself short because you're at the end of your first year and usually if people fail out of a program it's in that first year true you know true. so your your experience is very valid like you've made it through those two semesters most people who end up dropping out are done after the first semester you know and you've made it through both and you're doing fine so like you've kind of made it through the hardest part that gets most people out so like don't sell yourself short that's one. one. Like what you've learned <laughs> is valid. Two, um, what was I going to say? I think that's like a point that I haven't really covered much, but that's like, a, I think it's a good point that it's not necessarily about the behaviors. It's about people not wanting to change, you know, because they don't want to be that person or they never even thought about it. Like, I don't think people think about it this way, but they like, if someone didn't grow up being an excellent student all the time, being the smart kid in class, seeing themselves that way, like, oh, that's just Elizabeth. She's raising her hand again. She did her work early <laughs> again. Oh, who did the best on the project? Frickin' Elizabeth again. <laughs> like, if you were never that person, being that person and doing things that that person does is, like, just foreign to you. But it's like, right. if you ever play a video game and there's, like, the little treasure chest that you unlock and then you have, like, some new weapon to use, it's the same way. It's like, okay, now I'm frickin' Elizabeth. Okay? So now... I'm going to read before class and I'm going to raise my hand and ask a question about that. And they're like, wait, really? You? Yeah. Yeah. Me. I'm here now. I'm doing this. I'm going to be that straight A student, you know? And like, just even seeing yourself that way unlocks all those weapons that you never really had before. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. You know, you know what game you just made me think about Zelda, a link to the past. I was thinking Zelda. You was thinking Zelda. Okay. <laughs> I was thinking Zelda. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Great analogy. Bring, bring, bring. And there's like your little axe. And like now you can do more. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Literally. Like I know this sounds like out there or whatever, but just just think about it for a second. Just see yourself as that like pain in the butt, nerdy, glasses wearing, you know, person that always had the perfect grades and like had no friends or whatever. Like just live like that for a little bit it's okay and you're gonna just get through this freaking school and you don't worry your friends who care about you will still be with you prioritize them but they're priority number three now they're not one they're exactly. not two school is one your mental health is two then everything else exactly you know exactly and the people who care about you they will understand like they will get it and they will support some you will in some will another thing that you're doing um, and this is kind of a, an unfortunate way to think about it, but I think it's reality is by going through this program, it's not just another degree, you know, you can get a degree in English and stay the same person or whatever. Like, yeah, you're more educated now, but like, it's just, okay, you haven't, you have an English degree by getting a physician assistant degree. You're basically guaranteed a job, which puts you in like the middle to upper class or whatever. So like now society sees you differently. You have a responsibility that's different than most people. And like some people just will never really understand or respect that, or they might be jealous or whatever. 
but like some people will unfortunately probably drop off and that may happen even during your training not just during your career exactly so like that unfortunately may have to happen people who don't understand what do you mean you can't face time for two hours tonight i need you my my boyfriend's being mean again uh he he didn't cook the he didn't cook the eggs the way i like them i said over medium and he made them over easy like <laughs> all right we'll talk maybe even about this but maybe this weekend like right now i, I gotta do this i'm very sorry right you know right. if it's something really important i got into a car accident i'm in the hospital my boyfriend's like hitting me yeah okay i'm talking right now i'm coming over right. but like just your typical conversations they just may have to be lower on your on your list yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. and sometimes honestly like i don't want to be negative about it but sometimes honestly like if there is a situation like that in which the other person is like they just do not understand and they don't try to understand mm -hmm. and the relationship falls off. Like maybe you just got to accept that and think like, okay, it's for the best, you know, like, yeah, because like people who love you, they want to see you succeed. Even if that means like you got to divert some of your time to school. Mm -hmm. So yeah, some of those things happen for the best. <laughs> that relationship was going to go anyway, if that's what's happening with it. Like yeah. you, it's because like as a student, okay, you're not successful or whatever. You're a student, but you're acting like you are. You're acting like, oh, you're important. Your time's important. Yeah, it is, but it will be for the rest of your life when you're practicing. Because like right. once you have a medical license, everyone freaking wants a piece of you. Exactly. Everybody wants your time nonstop. So like school is just kind of the introduction to that. So if that relationship falls off now, it was going to anyway, you know, down the line. <laughs> right. Yeah. So exactly. I, I'm not going to like share who this was or exactly the circumstances, but I remember before my second PA school interview, the one that actually got me into school, I was freaking out. I was freaking out. I was doing like nonstop, like pretend questions kind of in the mirror. Cause I didn't like, I did have someone to practice with, but they were being very unhelpful. They were like, why are you doing this? I was like, because this is important and I want my career to, what do you mean? Why am I doing this? And so <laughs> like, I basically had to like go into a different room and like practice by myself because this person wasn't helping. And so like, I was just looking in the mirror and like pretending, like putting myself in the position and asking like countless interview questions as like the interviewer and then switching chairs and then being like the interviewee and just practicing, practicing, practicing. Wow. And then this person was just not helping and they were anti-helping. They were like, you're, you're doing too much. Like, this is stupid. Why are you working so hard? Like, what do you mean? What do you mean? Why? Like, how do you not get that? So right. you're going to have that. You're going to have that all the time with, why are you studying? What do you mean you can't go out? You're going to bed when? You should take it easy. Like, no, I should not. I have stuff to do. <laughs> 100%. 100%. Yeah. So, yeah, ho hopefully that makes sense to people. I think this conversation can help. I think so, too. I think, I so, think so, too, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, it'll be hard well, to like initiate those conversations, but you know, you just got to be honest with people. Just be honest mm -hmm. and say, like, you know, maybe this, you know, this isn't helpful to me. And I just, mm -hmm. I'm in a place where I just need to focus on, you know, you know, where I was praying to be at. <laughs> like, yeah. you know, so. I mean, let's say your friend or your mom or whoever is Bob, like, Bob, I love you. I definitely want to hear what you have to say. Um, how urgent is this right now? Is this life or death? No. Okay. I'm going to study. I will call you. I promise in two days. Like, right. I think that's reasonable for someone who cares about you. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. As long as you're like communicating that, I don't, yeah, it should be reasonable for someone who wants to see you succeed. <laughs> I think so. But yeah. Okay. So that's how you uh, survive in PA school guys. That, that's the last chapter of this interview, probably. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, anything anything else you want to tell the uh, the pre-PAs out there, whoever's watching this? Yes. Um, I really do want to say, like, it sounds so cliche, but you will, if you put your mind to becoming a PA, you will become a PA. Like, you will get there. Just figure out what you need to do, whether it's, Bring your GPA up, get more clinical experience, any volunteering, shadowing, anything like that. Figure out what you need to do. Like, be realistic with yourself. 
set a plan for yourself and you will be able to become a PA. Even if it takes a while, as long as you have that dedication to becoming a PA, you will get there. You will get there. Mm -hmm. I promise. Like you will get there. And it's not easy, but just continue. Just strive on. So yeah. Yeah. I think that's that's the best thing that I could say. If you guys are down about your chances, uh Ms. Chanel's interview is posting probably a week after James's. If you haven't watched James's, watch James's. Like yeah. you think my story was some tenacity or Elijah's? Oh no. Like watch what James had to do. Right. Well, he got it. You right. Know? Exactly. He just spoiler alert. Well, I guess not spoiler because this is after his video posted. But a master's degree. Wait, two masters? I think two master's degrees and a yeah. post bag. And now he's in. You know, so like so much happened. So like it's possible. If he can do it's it, you can do it. Possible. 100%. For sure. It's definitely possible. You just gotta keep working at it. 100 percent Yeah. Absolutely. And then lastly, I don't think this one was on our topics list, but since I talked about it with Elijah and James, and my plan is actually to make like a compilation of the conversations I had with those two um, about diversity in the PA profession. I just wanted to give you a shot to like say your piece if you have anything to say about it, because it's a conversation that like it's had on the surface and then it's forgotten about. But like, I don't know if you read the intro to my book, but it's basically like these are the statistics. This is who gets in. And like, it's not changing. It's not moving. How do we, what do we do about this? Um, so do you have anything to say about that? Um, I, you know, that's actually a great question. I think it is so important. So <laughs> I think that is so important for minority groups, like people in minority groups um, to come into the PA profession, because like you said, the percentage is super low. I don't know it off the top of my head, but I know like the amount of I think black PAs is like less than 12% or I want to say, I want to say something around there. Either way, the percentage is single digits. super low. You said what? Yeah. I want to say single digits, low teens, single, single digits. digits. It's not higher than that. Mm, yeah. Yeah. I could imagine. <laughs> um, so yeah, like the fact that the PA profession is still like upcoming and more people are starting to find out about it also means that there's not, necessarily a lot of diversity in the profession and it's so important for like those in minority groups to apply like don't think that you're like at a disadvantage you know what i'm saying like apply mm -hmm. apply apply it's so important to just apply because like even your program too will help will like a lot of programs nowadays i've noticed too like they want to make their programs more diverse that different sorry they want to make their programs more diversified. They want to be able to, you know, learn how to incorporate diversity into their curriculum and things like that. And so it's mm -hmm. so important for like people to step out on faith and just apply because you really never know. Like these, like everyone wants to see diversity increase, especially when it comes to healthcare. Because even myself, like because my I'm first generation, my family's from the Caribbean. Like it grew up in my family mm -hmm. that, like you know, you don't really trust healthcare professionals. Like that's just what it was. Like, yeah. you know, they, you try to like do these home remedies and it's only up mm -hmm. until that the home remedy doesn't work that you decide to go to the doctor. Unfortunately right. for me, you know, I had asthma, so I didn't really have a choice. Like my, my dad didn't have a choice. My mom didn't have a choice, but to bring sure. me to the hospital. But you know, a lot of, um, uh, you know, students with, um, parents that are immigrants, they don't believe in the healthcare system to have their best interests at heart. So it's so mm -hmm. important for um, people in minority groups to be able to see that representation in healthcare. You know what I'm saying? So I, I think really and truly, like if you're interested in the PA profession, especially like definitely apply because like the future of healthcare need, needs you. Like there's so many high mortality rates and like OBGYN for, um, Oh yeah. You know, for women of color and things like that. And so, I mean, it's a lot more than that, but like, that's something that I've seen a lot of recently. And so it's just so important for people to feel like, like patients to feel like, you know, someone who looks like them is like hearing their concerns and not just like mm -hmm. dishing it away and things like that. So I, I do generally feel like the PA profession is trying to, you know, increase diversity. 
Um, I see that a lot here at my program. So mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I got to give them a shout out, but definitely like it's so important to have you know, more diversity in any healthcare profession, but especially healthcare professions in which like PAs and PEs, um, physicians in which you're going to be sort of like the lead of the patient's care, you know? Mm -hmm. So definitely Outside. if you're, if you're thinking about applying or even if you're in PA school, like spread the word about like increasing diversity and things are so important. I, I didn't want to interrupt that like so many things I wanted to comment on there, but I just like wanted to let you uh, say your piece. But the one thing for sure, I've definitely noticed in like immigrant communities from doesn't matter like what race the immigrants is like my, my community is like this, the Russian folks, they don't trust doctors. They only want to go to like a Russian doctor. And then, you know, it's just, it, it just stinks. So with the whole diversity thing and like the whole representation thing in medicine, like James and I covered this quite a bit and it was like, I want to see people who look like me as providers. That's definitely part of it. Uh, when you were talking, I thought of an even more important point, I feel like, because like, yes, it's definitely important to see someone who looks like you or your parents in an authoritative figure, like hundred percent makes you think that you can do it. It makes you kind of trust what they're saying more, but like, that's not the be all end all because we can't like, can't always have a provider that looks like you. And that's just like not sustainable, you know, because what am I only supposed to treat bald Caucasian men like what? Um, so there's that. But what's I feel like even more important is having the knowledge of the medical system in the community by having providers from each community. So like who's going to bring that knowledge, even if you're not seeing the doctor, it's people talking to their parents, their friends, the people in their community, like having been a provider. You know, right. I feel like that network and that connection is even more important than just the, the doctor patients or the PA patient relationship, uh, which right. is also important. But it's like, let's say, I don't know, my parents keep giving out my number to their family members and they keep calling me. Right. So it's like, OK, my doctor's really not explaining this. What do they mean? Or what do I do about this? And then I tell them something that maybe their doctor already told them. But because it's coming from me, they're like, OK, you're Russian. You're from the motherland. We trust what you're saying. We know your mom. If you're telling me bullshit, I'm going to yell at your mom and she's going to yell at you. So like, it's just, <laughs> it's in the community. Right. So like right. I would be telling them the same thing that their PA might be telling them, but they'll trust me because it's coming from me. Right. So I think that's the real gift of diversity in the medical profession is because you're like kind of getting medical knowledge, modern me medical knowledge into communities that perhaps don't have it. Because they, one, don't trust it, or two, they just don't have access to it, or three, they don't have that personal access to it. We're like, oh, I can call you know, my mom's friend who's a PA, and they can answer this for me instead of making an appointment with a doctor who I don't know and don't trust and that kind of thing. Exactly. So yeah, exactly. I haven't even thought of that before, but I feel like that's yeah. a huge benefit of increasing diversity in the profession. Definitely. Like, <laughs> yeah. I, like on Instagram, I will... I will, I remember when I first started like posting about like PA school on Instagram, like my personal page, mm -hmm. this is not like my mentorship page. And so many people that I like grew up with, like went to high school with and are still connected with, didn't know what a PA was. And they started like flooding oh, yeah. my inbox. Like, yeah, like, oh, what's a PA? Like, what do they do? And here I am explaining, like I had to make a separate video to explain, okay, these are the roles of a PA. This is what a PA does. This is where they can work. You know, these are the things that they can do. So mm -hmm. I think definitely like just having that knowledge in the community allows people and having it come from a person that they trust will yes. like allow people to understand what PAs do. Not only just PAs, it can work with any um, healthcare professional, but specifically like PAs because, you know, I'm on that route. Um, yeah. And it's, it's, it's still up and coming kind of thing, but um, like spreading that knowledge and having them spread it now to their families because it came from me and they trust mm -hmm. me it makes a huge difference and like people wanting to even access health care because a lot of yeah. immigrants and you know children of immigrants don't usually want to because it's a generational thing like you just you know you learn mm -hmm. and it makes you not want to but like having someone to like tell you okay yeah like that's you should actually like go seek treatment for this or you know what your doctor said was you know, right. Oh, you know, it makes mm -hmm. a difference in people trusting health, the healthcare system. Yeah. hundred percent. And so from that, then how do we fix it? 
how do we keep helping? Because like you said, a lot of programs have that on their website. Like, yeah, we're committed to diversity. Okay, so what are you doing about it besides writing a paragraph? Uh, maybe they'll help like in the admissions process a little bit, but before you even have the admissions process, people need to be applying. I, I don't think it's so much that they're not, like the schools aren't helping you get in. I think it's that people aren't applying and exactly. people aren't applying because they don't think they can do it or they don't even know about it. Exactly. Exactly. Right? So yeah. that's why I think these conversations are even more important. Yeah. You know, just straight up like, Hey, guess what? It's possible. Like, right. Why wouldn't you do this? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Cause obviously like a big city, like New York where I'm from, it's very mm -hmm. like diverse. Um, you're exposed to a lot of different cultures. So if you're looking for some like a school, I would say like New Jersey or New York or, you know, somewhere with mm -hmm. a big city, it's going to be more sure. diverse than like a rural population or maybe a, a, sure. like a certain suburban population. But those schools too want to increase diversity, you know, like they want to have, you know, a more diverse student population to produce those mm -hmm. more diverse um healthcare providers. So don't shorten your chance. Like, don't think like, you know, you only have to apply to this certain type of school or whatever the case may be, like definitely apply to as much school as you can find, even if it's not in the environment that you feel like mm -hmm. you want to be in, but you will be able to learn a lot in that environment. Because the thing about it too, is you want more diverse healthcare providers, but at the same time, like for myself, right? Um, I'll just speak in terms of myself because it might be easier to understand. But like I grew up in a predominantly black neighborhood when I was like in elementary school and things like that. Mm -hmm. But I put myself out of my comfort zone and went to school in Manhattan. So that's when I was like really like, exposed to like other cultures and other ethnicities. So like as a black woman myself, like I probably know how to take care. I would probably know how to better connect with a black patient because you know that's part of my identity as well but when it comes to treating you know um a white patient you know how do i approach that situation i feel like it's so important for minority students as minority students to also go into communities where they're not used to they might not be used to you know dealing with other populations so that they can learn from that as well like just as much as they want to learn from you and learn how to support you 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 know it's good to learn from them as well. Yeah, put yourself like outside sense. of your comfort zone. Yeah, yeah, you definitely got to put yourself yeah. outside of your comfort zone. James was talking about that, like when he was selecting a school, because he was looking at like schools in like Montana or something. Oh, and then <laughs> something like it might have been Montana, maybe Wyoming, but like some are way out there. And uh, and then his parents were telling him like, you know, maybe don't, because maybe it's not really safe out there for you. Which I'm not really sure. Because, I mean, they, they have, like, Black people are in every state, in every community, maybe more in some communities than others. And, yeah, in, like, maybe areas like Wyoming. I don't know. I, I've never been to Wyoming. So, like, no <laughs> disrespect to Wyoming. But, like, maybe there's more people that, you know, would do something or would just feel some certain way and just make you uncomfortable. I don't know exactly. Um, I probably would have not thought that that was even a thing until this year. when it, So I'm moving to North Carolina, to Raleigh, North Carolina. Oh, uh, in a couple months. That's actually where James is from. Uh, so I'm moving there shortly and I've spent the last five years in upstate New York and before that in Cleveland mm. and I'm Jewish. And so like, I never really thought about it being an issue. I was just like, I'm basically another Caucasian person. But then my friend who lived in North Carolina is like, yeah, there's some people that really don't like Jews down here. And I'm like, mm. what? Like, that's a thing. And then like something you don't think about, but then so I definitely get the whole put yourself out of your comfort zone thing, but also like mind your safety, you know, 100%, maybe yeah. talk to the school, talk to other people like, is this okay for me? Be honest. How, how are people treated? You know, right. like just because you don't want to be uncomfortable for two years. Like it's hard enough. Exactly. I was going to touch on like, that. Go, too. go somewhere Definitely. like that's okay for you to be at, like go somewhere safe where you're treated well. Right. And, you, and of you course, know? like you want to apply to these schools too, but you and it, it's good to apply to those schools, too, that are trying to increase diversity. But you also have to make sure, too, like those schools have measures to make sure that you're comfortable, um, mm -hmm. you know, and that they will, like, protect you and things like that. So, right. How's the community? Because, like, then you're out in the hospital, you know, the local hospital or whatever. That how's the community going to treat you? 
Right. Is someone going to have an opinion? Is someone going to like, you're walking to the parking lot at night? Like, I just, I see what James's parents are coming from. Yeah. So exactly. maybe visit first or something. Yeah. Just, it's something that you shouldn't have to think about, but think about it. Oh, definitely. Definitely. You know? Yeah. Unfortunately. But yeah, again, not to make this depressing. But, <laughs> I think yeah. the mo I think the moral is like just don't limit yourself. Like, don't mm -hmm. don't limit yourself. Like, definitely, you know, apply to. You don't have to be a minority, like part of the part of a minority group. But even if your parents are immigrants, um, like don't don't limit yourself. Apply to schools that you know want to see an increase in diversity. Whether and it doesn't even have to be just racial diversity. It can be like, you know, um, sexual orientation or, you know, like there's so many other different ways you can be diverse. Mm -hmm. So, I just just don't limit yourself. Like there's a lot of options and a lot of schools are looking to grow in that. And if you just take the correct measures to, I guess, make sure like you understand the community and they will support you through school. Then as long as you have the mm -hmm. support system, I think it's definitely something that's doable. Totally agree. It's actually weird to say, but males are a, are a uh, what do you call it? I'm not going to say minority. diverse group. That's a minority. There you go. In PA programs, it's 70 plus percent female. Right. 70 plus. Like my program had 75 people. I think maybe 10 guys, if not less. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Like there was none of us. Uh, so that that's always an interesting thing to do. I don't think any of those guys are like complaining necessarily, especially if they're not married. But still, you know, if you happen right. to be a guy, I understand you're a minority, buddy. So it's going to be a little different for you because your classmates, right. your professors, most people you're working for, they're going to be female. Exactly. Exactly. That's always an interesting little tidbit about the whole minority situation in PA schools. It's like, unless you're a Caucasian female, you're not only a minority, you're like a tiny minority. Exactly. Because it's like 70 plus Caucasian female. Right. Exactly. You know, it's not 51, 49. It's like 70 plus one demographic. <laughs> exactly exactly yep which is weird because the profession started with crusty old male navy veterans coming back from vietnam yeah i don't know how it got switched around i don't know i do the suburban <laughs> people found out about it and they're like what my daughter can do what and then they're just like all right here's how you do this go 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 get him elizabeth <laughs> and so that's how it happened over the last like 20 years or 30 years i guess but like it started with these like war-torn you know, veteran corpsmen coming back going like, well, I don't want to be a doctor, but how do I do this? And then like, it just morphed into what it is now. And now the profession's just like, all right, let's maybe be a little bit diverse. Just, just a little bit, just right. a tiny bit more. So the schools are doing their best, but I think the best way to go is just getting the information out there. Like we are right now. Right. Exactly. Exactly. The and more people know about it, the better. hundred percent. Well, yeah. No, I'm glad we talked about that piece because I what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to clip out, like I'm going to leave it in this interview as this just long form interview, but I'm going to clip out what we talked about and what me and Elijah talked about and what me and James talked about and just make it a whole like diversity in the PA profession video because mm -hmm. it's something that needs to be talked about. I think that's the only way that it just improves. I agree. And thank you for asking that. That was a really good topic to touch on that I didn't even, you know, consider. So Maybe that was because, really like, so. After talking to James and Elijah, it sounds like your class is quite diverse. Like it's yeah. not all Caucasian females. No. <laughs> That's probably um, why you're not thinking about it. Yeah, because my class is, I I think it's like that 51 to 49% ratio, if I'm being honest. Um, yeah. There are less males than females, but I think in terms of like um, ethnicity is pretty diverse. And then mm -hmm. also like sexual orientation is very diverse as well. So you get to learn from all aspects, mm -hmm. um, you know. Yeah, so you guys actually like have a diverse class. It's not quite as obvious. You walk in and you're like, oh man, there is nobody here like me. Exactly. You know, as an old guy and as a male, I was just like so isolated. I was like, I don't know what to talk to you people about. <laughs> so it's it's hard when like everybody is of one demographic. It's It's better when there's just more representation of like, age, gender, uh, race, socioeconomic status, immigrant status, like just a little bit more of actual representation of America, not just like one block. Because then it's exactly. like everybody else just feels so isolated. 
you know, myself included. Oh, white guy feels isolated. Yeah. Cause nobody else is like me. Right. So it's just like, you know what I mean? There was one other veteran, but he happened to be, you know, married and had a kid. So he was never there. Mm. So it's just like, yeah, I think it's an important thing to talk about and an important thing to increase. No offense to Caucasian females. I'm sorry. Like we love you guys. No, it's we just definitely like, this love is you our guys. perspective. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Yeah. We definitely love you guys. It's just, you know, it's just something oh, you guys that are awesome. we talked about. <laughs> I think James and I talked about that, too, because we were talking about that. And it's like it sounded like we like didn't like Caucasian females. And I was like, buddy, no, like we don't. We, it's not that. And oh, no, it was more about the fact that James and I were both older because he's 36. So right. it was the fact that we're both older students. Like I was 29, 30 in the program. He's 36 in the program. And then we were talking about young people and how like they're going to have trouble kind of relating to patients and whatnot, especially older ones. Um, mm -hmm. And then we realized like, it sounds like we're, we're saying bad things about them. We're not. We're just, first off, we're jealous because we wish that we found this earlier. Like you did <laughs> one and two, like by the time you're our age, you're going to be like so far ahead of where we are right now. Cause you've been practicing for 10 years. Right. So like if you're a 20 year old Caucasian female watching this, Literally, I'm just, I'm just, I'm jealous of you. It's not that I'm like hating you or saying anything bad about you. It's just like, I'm jealous of, you know, your position in life and keep calm and chive on. <laughs> or carry on or whatever. Yeah. Anyway, it's always an awkward topic to talk about because someone's always going to feel left out mm -hmm. and it just is what it is. It doesn't mean we shouldn't talk about it. I agree. I agree 100%. Yeah. And honestly, I feel like, like you yep. said, like that, diversity really matters because like I'm 24 but I feel like I learned so much from like the other students like my peers who are older than me like there's so much that I learned from them that it in a way makes me feel like I'm going to be a better provider because you know you have more life experiences than me like you know outside of just PA school like you had a totally different life than mm -hmm you know, what I had and you're older than me. So of course you have, you know, you've experienced more things. So I feel like what I learned, especially from James too, he's amazing. Um, yeah, he is. What I learned from like my other peers and even the class above me and stuff like that. Like it's, it's great to have that diversity in, in every area. Mm -hmm. So yeah, hundred percent. Maybe we should show this to some PA school admissions folks. <laughs> But yeah, maybe we should. <laughs> I'm sure some are, I don't know, hopefully some are watching, but I don't know. As this channel gets bigger and bigger, I can talk to more people. So we'll see what we can do. But anyway, I'm taking my folks to a concert. So we should all probably get ready. So I'm probably going to end it here. Is there any very important final parting words or do you think we covered everything? I think we covered everything. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm just so happy that you know, you decided to do this interview with me. So thank you again. Cause yeah, yeah. Thanks for taking the time. Of course. Anytime. But yeah, I appreciate Absolutely. it. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for taking the time, sharing your story, sharing your wisdom. And did you say you have a YouTube channel or how do you, how do you reach out to folks? Oh, I'm working on my YouTube channel, so I'm not going to put that out there quite yet, but okay. <laughs> I do have an Instagram. So if people want to reach me that way, I'm more than willing, more than happy to talk to you guys. Okay. And I'll put her Instagram in the info for the video so y'all can reach out if you'd like. I was just going to say, we could also post this on your channel if you'd like, but if there's no YouTube channel quite yet, then. That would be actually amazing. Um, <laughs> if yeah, I so like. Oh my God. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm still yeah. working on it, but I'll definitely like, well, if whenever you have the time, like there's no rush, like I would definitely like post it if you could like send it to me. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just edit it. And cause I guarantee you like, the stream yard thing and like our videos are going to need to be doctored a little bit, but we'll figure that out. Uh, but yeah, thank you guys for watching. Hopefully you got something out of that. I'm going to end the recording and we're going to chat for a second afterwards, but Ms. Chanel, thank you for coming on, sharing everything that you shared, and we'll see her again soon, I hope. Yes, thank you guys. Have a good one. <laughs> Bye.